Hello and welcome to Eye on Israel. I am your host, Shahar Azani. On this series, we explore the most captivating individuals who are shining light on Israeli life and society, both in Israel and around the world. Today, we're honored to speak with an accomplished woman who, simply put, has decided to strive for the impossible. Olga Mesho is an attorney and corporate consultant from South Africa. She is actively involved in many projects to end the inequalities between different groups in South Africa as a result of the racial discrimination of the past. She is also a passionate supporter of Israel and is the COO of DAISY, Defend, Embrace, Invest in, and Support Israel. This organization works tirelessly in the media, on campuses, and with other organizations to defend Israel. The DAISY especially focuses on combating the so-called apartheid analogy. As young Africans, they know the true legacy of apartheid and what the term actually means. By openly and completely rejecting the analogy, they create a strong voice opposing the delegitimization of Israel in South Africa and around the world. Welcome, Olga. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here. What it's a blessing. such a pleasure that you made the trip from South Africa to New York and to share such an incredible story. But first, maybe tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Olga Mesho? So Olga Mesho, she's the eldest of three children. And um, I spent some time here in the United States while growing up, but uh, a lot of it was back home in South Africa, Johannesburg. I was in legal practice full time for about eight years, but I have a passion for young people and a passion for community work. And so even though I'd done well and made partner before the age of 30, I was like, mm, there must be something out there that I feel as if I can lend my, myself to from a cause perspective. And so before now- Before the age of 30. Before the age of 30, yes, worked hard. Um, but yes, it was a blessing. So now I'm a director at a consulting firm called Transcend Corporate Advisors. And we look to assisting companies from a strategic perspective as to how they can ensure that their efforts with regards to broad-based black economic empowerment legislation, which is a piece of legislation that government has put in, to try and assist bridging the economic gap that has occurred as a result of the apartheid regime between black and, and white people, the underprivileged and those that had opportunities during apartheid, and seeing how they can be empowered. So we assist companies with regards to how do they train their employees, how do they train people in um, the communities? How do they do community development work? Um, how do they assist small businesses to become more thriving? Um, because if we're going to create jobs and employment opportunities in South Africa, then it's going to be um, amongst the small businesses. So that's been an awesome place to be because it allows me to apply my corporate experience from the legal space, but also to be involved in changing lives and um, getting a better understanding of the social context of what's going on in South Africa, but it also then allows me to fulfill my, my heart's desire of engaging with the young people and just seeing what the future lies within South Africa and what the narrative is and how we can play a positive role in influencing that so that in the next five, ten years, the awesome opportunities that are existing in South Africa and Africa, frankly, are going to be able to come to the fore. So, yeah, I'm confused. You're <laughs> speaking about social justice, mm -hmm. black empowerment, overcoming inequalities, and yet... If I were to follow what the media says or, or the BDS movement says, how does that go hand in hand with being such a staunch advocate for Israel? How did you get from that point to that point? Well, you see, the values of ensuring that truth is represented, the values of ensuring that people get equal opportunities to be able to be who they are and to be who they are proudly, um, and to ensure that the injustices that we experienced as um, South Africans, and particularly black South Africans through apartheid, never happens again, is part of the reason why I actually find myself doing um, DAISY work. So DAISY stands for Defend, Embrace, Invest in, and Stand by or Support Israel. And its reason for existence is actually to deliberately oppose what the BDS movement is doing. They're talking about Israel being an apartheid state. Um, and frankly, first of all, we've got to stand up for the truth. The fact that Israel is an apartheid state is an absolute lie. And, you know, I'm sure we'll speak a little bit about that just now. Um, but truth and integrity and hope um, and frankly, just real opportunities for everybody is, is part of the reason as to why I do what I do. And as a, as a South African, 
when you hear the accusations on world media, on campuses about Israeli apartheid, how does that make you feel? Well, Do you buy into these claims? I, I Is there any truth to it? There, there absolutely isn't. You know, so I've come to the U.S., right? And a lot of people... Their understanding of what the U.S. is is based on what they, they read on the media and what they see in Hollywood movies. So they're expecting everybody to be like, yo, 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 what's up, what's up? And, and then similarly, when I arrive here on the shores of New York, even though this is now the year 2015, people will be like, oh, so did you buy those clothes at the airport or, you know, do you wear that? And I'm just like, okay, hang on. You surely don't believe everything that you read in the newspapers. You surely don't believe everything that you read or rather see on TV. There's more to, to just that. And so similarly, um, we're encouraging as Daisy people to investigate is there truth behind what people are saying as to Israel being an apartheid state. I've had the blessing of being to Israel three times. Minority groups in Israel are enjoying more liberties and more freedom that black South Africans enjoyed. My parents were directly impacted by apartheid. I'm still at times impacted by it. I can walk into a meeting and people will be like, where's your boss? And I'm like, well, I am the boss. But you see a young black South African, even in this day and age, is not necessarily supposed to be in charge of, you know, of leading a particular meeting or, or being responsible. So it is actually an insult to compare the world's only democratic state in the Middle East as apartheid. It trivializes what we went through, what my parents went through, even part of what we are still as a nation struggling with. A lot of the uneasiness that's taking place is because 22 years after democracy, f people still aren't feeling as if opportunities are being made available to them in order to thrive, in order to um, get into workspaces in the economy where they previously were not able to. So. The BDS, if you're just going to take what they're saying, is a total lie, and there is truth with regards to who Israel is, and we're about getting that truth out. So let me ask you bluntly, before I want to touch on your family that you mentioned before, mm -hmm. one of the most prominent figures in the BDS discussion is uh, Desmond Tutu. Mm. What is his weight in South African public opinion? How, uh, how is he viewed by the younger generation or you know the majority of the South African public and in that in that respect because he is prominent in the struggle against the state of Israel so Desmond Tutu played a phenomenal role in in the liberation of the South African people in, in apartheid um, he remains a respected person I respect him you know as, as an individual Daisy respects him as an organization as well that however being said even the most authoritative persons, even from a moral perspective, can be wrong. And with all due respect, um, Bishop Desmond Tutu is very wrong with regards to Israel, um, and Israel particularly being compared to an apartheid state. His relevance from a vocal perspective or an impressionable perspective I'm finding, we are finding, is becoming less and less weighty in the South African context. The now generation that is rising up and that has identified themselves with this particular cause are, are more youthful. They want to understand what is the now. Yes, we understand and we appreciate that he, together with other people, played a role then, but they're looking for now leaders, leaders that are cognizant of what the struggle is perceived to be now and that are going to lead them going forward. You know, he, he's, he is old and he's also even even with regards to his work in the church, has passed on the baton to other individuals. He many times jokes about the fact that he's retired, but not really retired. Um, and so from an activism perspective, at least in South Africa, um, he is still looked up to, but his voice isn't as, as weighty as what I've come to understand it is here in the United States. So let, let's, let's talk about uh, young South African leadership. Recently, mm -hmm. uh, we saw the reports in the media that a prominent student leader in South Africa, one of the leaders on the campuses, who's also a political active and mm -hmm. Known figure mm. claimed uh, his admiration mm. to Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. Is this the future of South African young leadership? Absolutely not. Now, here is a young man, and I, and I say this both w with respect to a fellow leader, here is a young man who is engaging, a young man who has the ability to influence, and a young man who, frankly, I believe was looking for some sort of person to admire or, or tag on to because there needs to be a cause. A lot of young people in South Africa just want to do the right thing and they want to identify with something that will make a mark in history. 
So here is this young individual, with all due respect, I mean, the majority of South Africans were absolutely appalled with what he said. Even though he said that he doesn't respect Adolf Hitler for killing the Jews, he respects and admires the fact that this man was able to rally a nation and rally a people behind a cause that was justifiable. So Quite at the, the very... Cause. You know what I'm saying? So at the very same time where he was able to say such and, and actually say such out of ignorance, there's a lot of other young people who, unfortunately, because of ignorance as well, are being lured by the BDS to say this is a cause worth fighting for. And they are motivated to agree with that cause because they just want to do the right thing. But what I'm excited about is that I represent a breed, and I know that there's more like me, who are able to intelligently apply the facts and look through a prism of peace and a prism that accepts that there's not just one dimension that we need to look at things. So even though a person may admire Adolf Hitler's leadership abilities, how dare we make that such a simplistic admiration to say there's one aspect, even though that particular aspect of him was, uh, was manifested in such evil ways. So a breed of young people that are able to say, let's look at the fact that this entire world needs hope, there needs to be justice, there's so many issues that are at stake from, from poverty to terrorism, and let's find individuals that are able to collaborate together for truth, and, and let's create opportunities for that to happen. The many people would say that, and you relate it to your leadership and to the existence of people of your kind who would lead South Africa to a better future. Some people would say there is no hope. There is no hope for South Africa. There is no hope for Israel in South African public opinion. And I want to ask you today, Olga, are you on a Don Quixote's mission? <laughs> you know, if I think about the conversations that were being had when negotiations were happening around um, the liberation of the African National Congress, right. and then when we had the upcoming first democratic elections in 1994. Right. Who can forget? There was a lot of conversations as to there's going to be civil war. And I remember my family going shopping, and in fact, they weren't going shopping. They were observing other people going shopping, stocking up on food supplies because there was not going to be any food and there was going to be bloodshed. People told us that there wasn't going to be hope in South Africa. But South Africans decided that we were going to ensure that there was going to be hope. Peace-loving South Africans who understood the power of the differences being laid aside and us standing together and identifying with our similarities. So the very same way that people want to say that there is no hope for peace in the Middle East, and even now, frankly, people wanting to use whatever role was played by Israel in apartheid, um, you know, they forget that even though the government of that time may have made some decisions and contributions to the apartheid movement that we question, there were individuals that were very strategic with regards to ensuring that the likes of Nelson Mandela, that the ANC, frankly, itself, were able to continue with their cause. But that being said as well, we have got a beautiful opportunity at this point in time, at a time where people want peace on both sides in relation to what's going on in the Middle East, to make a decision to say just as South Africa and South Africans were able to put aside their many differences, they chose to overcome that. They chose to compromise and say, let's identify with what is common with each other and move forward hand in hand. So there is hope peace. for South Africa. 100%. Is there hope for Israel's uh, status in South African public opinion? Well, for the very reasons that I'm articulating now, that if people choose to see beyond the negative that's just been showing there. what will make there, them see beyond? Understanding. Understanding of what the truth is about, and that's part of why DAISY is so important and important in South Africa. Right. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, people just want to do the right thing. And so when they hear that there is a, a nation of people that are suffering or that have the potential to suffer with regards to apartheid, then they get up and they get all excited because we cannot allow that to happen. But just as we've been able to show that, first of all, apartheid is not happening in Israel. Right. We've been there, and we're showing facts on facts as to what's going on. The wonderful attributes and the contributions that Israel has to offer the African people, the South African people. One of the things that I'm passionate about that I've already said is seeing the development of my people. So when there is a community that is not able to produce food, for example, for itself because there's water shortage or um, they're going through a period of doubt, a period of, uh, a period of drought, excuse me, but then there's technology from and Israel. doubt in many ways. 
there's technology from Israel that says, here, if you use this, then you'll be able to water your garden, you'll, you'll be able to create um, right. option, you know, vegetables, for example, that will be able to not only feed you, but feed your community. The question that I then have to the BDS and to everybody else is to then say, should we not allow our people to be empowered from a food security perspective, but also from job opportunities, if they were going to sell that and make businesses, just because you've got some political cause that actually has got no depth and no meaning, even from a factual perspective. And the answer has to be no. The answer has to be that we desire to see the upliftment of our country, even by a people and from a people who they may not necessarily identify with in all respects. So there is hope for, for Israel and South African um, relations. And we've seen it ourselves in terms of people gaining an understanding. And as then you saw an impact. You saw the change. One, one, uh, 100%, absolutely. Were people surprised when Daisy came to them with education? We know how important education is, both at Stand With Us and Daisy, mm -hmm. and the work that's being done with the general public. Have you seen that metamorphosis? Have you seen that change when you presented that farmer with Israeli technology and suddenly they're witnessing Israel in that capacity? We absolutely have, because the positive side of who Israel is is not being presented, True. right? She's been demonized. On GBS? On JBS it does. On JBS she does, and, and we appreciate JBS. Right. And in fact, we need to get JBS more and more into I South agree. Africa. So we I need agree. a we need a partner up there. Um, so we're seeing just even as we present them with facts to to say like for example, do you know that ten out of the most popular stills that were used in South Africa um, during Operation Protective Age, nine of them were false from Syria and from various other places. And right. people are like, okay, hang on. Um, when I, as a black person, and, and you know, I, I've been getting it from my dad, he's been doing a lot of um, pro-Israel advocacy work, and there's a lot of other persons like him that stand up and say, I'm a black person that comes from South Africa. This is what I went through. Are Israelis going through that? Or not even are Israelis going through that? Are Palestinian people going through that? Are the minority groups in Israel going through that? And people sort of take a step back because they're now having to apply their facts, and they're like, Actually, no. no, tell us more. And so we found that that's what started to happen. So again, education um, being very crucial and we're wanting to do more work with the likes of Stand With Us um, because we found that as facts are presented to people and even um, the positive side of just general people being people, friendships being created, um, sure. opportunities being created, that at the end of the day, it's a case of, you know, people in the world just want to get along. So why don't we and just leave all of this, um, this right. foolishness honestly behind? So let me push on that point for a minute. You mentioned before to do the right thing. Yeah. But doing the right thing sometimes comes at a cost. Yeah. In this time and age to stand up against Israel, especially if you're of color or if you're Jewish or you, if you're an Israeli, it's fashionable. This is what people will accept. We're seeing and we live in an age where professors in the academia who support Israel would keep quiet because it may tarnish their image. Standing up for Israel in an environment like the South African campus environment and public opinion as we know it today, the, the arena in which Daisy works, is not an easy task. So has it taken a personal toll on you, Olga, standing up for Israel? Have you ever felt that toll in your personal life and professional life? I have. Um, but I'm blessed to come from a family that's taught us that standing up for truth and doing the right thing will come at a sacrifice. But what you want to ensure is that when history tells a story, that you are on the right side of history. If we look at um, civil rights movements that have happened over the years, when the cusp of the turning started to happen, somebody had to stand up and say something that was unpopular, but that's something that would encourage people to shift their mindset with regards to where they needed to be. So the cost of what we are incurring, I'm personally incurring, um, being vilified on, on social media platforms and um, people not necessarily now wanting to engage with you because they're not sure as to you know where you stand, even though that's happening, for me, what's even more satisfying is when I see the enlightenment in people's eyes, when I see how um, young people are, or, and even old people are getting opportunities and technology assistance with regards to Israel, how it's changing their health. I'm also seeing the creation of beautiful friendships across color lines, across faith lines. And frankly, Shahar, if I'm to lose a few friends, if I'm to lose popularity for the now, but then be able to sow seeds that are going to germinate within the next 5, 10, 15 years' time, then, then that's okay. Because then when history tells a story as to peace and stability and, and greater harmony, not only in the Middle East, but in, across Africa and the United States, I want to be on the right side of history and still be able to say that I was bold enough to make a stand that was able to actually bear real fruit and real peace and real harmony.
You mentioned your family. Yes. Tell me a bit about your family. Um, have they been supportive of your endeavors? Are you uh, a fruit off of that tree? Or have they ever tried to dissuade you from taking those unnecessary risks? Because we all know that um, facing evil, the most difficult thing is to stand up to evil. It's much easier yeah. to look the other way. You know, in fact, when I at times get scared or when I at times am tired, the thing that keeps me going is my family because I think about having to go back to the Mishra table and be like, oh, I gave up. And I can tell you now, the entire family would look at me like, are you crazy? This is not what you were born to do. My dad, in fact, is the um, founder and the visionary of Daisy. Um, he has been a vocal um, supporter of Israel since his first day in the South African parliament. Imagine being a man who stands up and when 200 odd other people are looking at you and expecting you to say the most popular thing, you stand up and you say something that is truth. And at that point in time, you're unpopular, but then in 15 years time, and I've seen this happen, people will come up to him and say, you know what, Reverend Mishra, you are right. Um, my mother, an incredibly strong woman, she was in, um, in Iraq. At the end of last year, she got a call and people were saying to her, the Christian community, the women are crying, they are hurting because of what ISIS is doing. We need somebody to encourage them. And she speaks to my dad, my dad's like, go. She would send us notes to be like, we're 20 minutes away from ISIS. And we're like, ma, aren't you scared? She's like, no. If we're not going to encourage other people and accept the fact that we cannot live beyond our own comfort zone, then who else is going to do it? My brother and sister the same. Um, so I come from a family that is, is very strong, and I, and I really am thankful for them. Um, we're all in this together. We play different roles with regards to Israel advocacy and just with regards to transformation in South Africa, um, transformation in Africa. Um, so... Oh, it's, it's an awesome thing. And I frankly do believe as well, Shekhar, that if more parents and more leaders, in fact, you don't have to necessarily be related by flesh and blood, right. but even in terms of, you know, teachers to students and um, persons of faith to their community members, if more parents, more of these leaders were to invest the truth in their, in their students and encourage them to, to be people, people of integrity and not to always want the easy way out, um, we would see a lot more, I believe, um, more people, more young people in particular, not wanting to take the easy way out. I mean, we live in a culture where if you want food, go to McDonald's, you'll get it now. Right. If something's cold, put it in the microwave, you'll get it now. So we don't always appreciate, and not necessarily their own fault, because that's, what, that's the environment that they're growing in. So if nobody tells them the importance of hard work, the importance of perseverance, the value that you won't always get it right the first time, but just like when you ride a bike and you fall off, you get back on that bike and you keep going. And if so, we, if we aren't taught that, then we are going to become a people that are just lazy and not fully understanding what is important in order to have the right outcome. Right. Well, we have an example, if you'll allow me. You know, the BDS likes to say, together with many other voices, that apartheid, 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 Israel right. and South Africa, right. right? They make that comparison. Right. But what I've observed and what I listen to and also what I hear is that the Palestinian people as well as the Israeli people aren't encouraged to sit down around the table and negotiate with each other. There's no consideration with regards to peace talks. There's no consideration with regards to compromise. But I ask you, if anybody looks at our history as to how we came out of apartheid, there were negotiations between black and white. People that didn't necessarily like each other had to come into a room and find a solution that worked for them, that worked for South Africa. The Constitution of South Africa, which is hailed in the world as amongst the most liberal and most reformative, and you know, it, it, it's a blessing. That Constitution came about, and my dad was involved around, in that, in many organizations sitting around a table giving their representations to say what is going to be the best solution for South Africa. Yes, we did have a lot of international assistance and international influence, but at the end of the day, what came out was what was best for South Africans. And that's why part of what we are called as a rainbow nation, all different colors coming together. We are not going to find the right solution for both the Palestinian situation as well as the Israeli situation, if the world wants to place demands, particularly on Israel, let's be frank, that's what they're doing. Right. They're not necessarily placing demands on Palestine, they're placing demands on Israel. Here is a particular resolution, you will vote on this. Here is what we believe as the West, or we believe as Europe, should be the map that needs to get out. Why can we not allow and encourage, and in fact demand, Palestinians, 
Israelis sit around the table and, and on all facets, through the educational system, through what's being told to people in Palestine and Israel on TV, that the best way to get a solution is to identify the fact that we need peace between us and what's going to work with us. Right. And you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. One of the things that we've learned is that when you negotiate a deal, there's got to be a little give and take. Right. If you don't have to give up anything, then that's not a fair deal. If I don't have to give up anything, that's not a fair deal. So let's be fair to Israel in this conversation and say, all right, Israel has been giving up Palestine, Palestinians, Palestinian Authority, you give up some, and then we'll actually see a difference. So I'm actually challenging the BDS and everybody else. If you want to follow through on the apartheid analogy, that is, let's go all the way to the negotiating table. So the lesson here is you are reframing the South African experience, and, in, and you say, indeed, this is the South African experience, but apartheid is the wrong equivalent. Absolutely. The South African experience is the bilateral negotiation. 100%. Which is um, a lesson unheard of in the realm of BDS. Allow me to ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. If you were to hope for something, today a new government was inaugurated in Israel. Um, the uh, Palestinian leader is about to visit the Vatican. The General Assembly will convene in a few months. If you had one wish you could put on the table as a South African for South Africa and for Israel, what would that be? Wow. We live in a day and age where there's so many challenges, so many challenges, but I do believe that people at their heart of hearts just want to wake up every morning and give the best for their families and have the best opportunities for themselves. So if, if our governments could be, what are the opportunities that we can create for our people? What are the opportunities that we can create for relations across borders, for relations across different color lines? What are the opportunities that we can ensure exist for um, the betterment of, of just society generally it would be that and not a case of what's in this for me and I'm just going to take this for me but more of a, of a relationship and an attitude and a leadership of how can I best serve you you know um, one of the one of the examples that I've learned from my faith is that if you want to be the greatest you've got to be the servant of all so governments and leaders that would teach more about um, servanthood serving each other caring for each other young people that would be about our parents have done so much from, for us. How can we take their lessons and improve that legacy to create a better future, not always want to be fighting and always wanting to be, have to prove ourselves? I'd be excited if that could be the case. You uh, echoed something that's very much uh, in resonance with the Jewish tradition of being the greatest ruler is the greatest server. Yeah. Servitude is leadership. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olga. We are sure to hear much more of the incredible work you do and Daisy does, and I have to tell you, as a human being, as an Israeli, as a Jew, I'm proud for all of the goodness that you provide to people in South Africa and the light that you spread around the world for the, for the cause of truth and for the cause of Israel. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have on today's show. Once again, I'm Shahar Azani. Thank you for tuning in and keeping an eye on Israel here on Jewish Broadcasting Service. Thank you very much.